Hi, this is Don Callis, and you're listening to the Interactive Interview. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Interactive Interview on the interactiveinterview.com. I'm James Walsh, and as always, by Daniel Edler, with our special guest, Don Callis. Don, how you doing? Couldn't be better. Tremendous. Tremendous. Ah, great to hear that. Dan, would you like to take the first one? Yes, uh, were you a wrestling fan growing up? Uh, big wrestling fan, yeah. I uh, grew up in Winnipeg, and uh, we had the AWA in here real strong, so I grew up watching uh, Nick Bach, Winkle Vern, Ganya, Jumpin' Jim Brunzel, guys like that. Mm-hmm. Dan, take the next one, too. Yeah, you had a relatively successful run in the Canadian wrestling. Um, what made you decide to focus more on being a manager than actual in-ring competitor? Um, well, I'd, when I went to WWF in 97, um, <clears throat> I'd been a wrestler for, I guess, about eight years and, and wrestled all over the world. My intention when I went there was to go there as a wrestler, and uh, when I got there, they kind of put me in a wrestling-slash-talker role, and um, I guess Vince kind of felt like, uh, you know, talking was my strong suit, and why not focus on that? And uh, I resisted it at first, but uh, he was certainly right about it, and uh you know, after a couple of months of um, getting paid to talk and not being banged up all the time like I was used to, uh, I realized it was probably a good idea, and I just kind of uh, went that role. Speaking of talking, you also hosted uh, No Holds Barred Radio. Uh, is, that still around, is that still around? Yeah, it is, actually. We do it uh, every Sunday out of Winnipeg, and uh, it's uh, been about four and a half years now. <laughs> do you have any schooling in broadcasting? Uh, no, I don't, actually. I just learned it all uh, <clears throat> coming up through wrestling because uh, the territory I started out in here uh, train, was trained by Tony Candela, who trained Roddy Piper. And um, Tony had uh, two television shows, actually, a real strong TV up in Canada. And, uh, you know, so I, for my very first time, uh, my very first match, I was on TV. And um, so I was used to being in front of a camera, used to how wrestling television worked. And then uh, I started booking for him, and then I started producing the television for him, and then I started doing the color commentary for him and hosting shows. and kind of got to do all the little jobs that you do with uh, producing wrestling, so um, I didn't have any formal training, kind of learned it on the job. Who did train you for actual wrestling? Uh, Tony did, um, Tony Candela, and uh, again, the same guy who trained Piper, and uh, that was my initial training, and then uh, from there, um, I did subsequent training with uh, Bad News Allen and Jerry Morrow. What was your opinion of the Truth Commission angle? Um, I don't know. I think it was it was um, kind of more like a 80s, 90s, early 90s kind of gimmick, uh, a little bit more black and white cartoonish than what they ended up doing. And I think part of the thing was 97 was when they really made the switch to attitude and kind of the more uh, gray area type of uh, storylines and characters. And, you know, having four guys in army uniforms, um, supposedly from South Africa, when a, a lot of a lot of the fans probably didn't even know what Truth Commission meant in terms of South Africa. Mm. Uh, probably wasn't the, 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 the best idea that they ever came up with, and I think they realized that fairly quickly because they, they kiboshed it fairly quickly. Mm. Uh, later, you managed Human Oddities. Um, two questions. First of all, uh, we interviewed Barry Buchanan uh, recently, and he, we asked him the same question about um, how was Kurgan in the ring um, as he's one of the more maligned internet characters uh, as regards to his ring uh, oh. presence. And secondly, how was it like working with Human Oddities? Uh, out of curiosity, what did Barry say about Kurgan? Uh, Barry kind of said sort of along the lines of he was um, he was good for his size and it's like big men sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Kurgan's one of the nicest guys in the business and uh, he's a good friend of mine. Um, you know, I mean, clearly Kurgan's not Ultimo Dragon, but then again, Kurgan's seven foot one and, and 360 pounds. Um, you know, I, I don't think he was, um, he certainly wasn't the best working big man ever. Um, you know, there, there's been big guys who, uh, who, who are better. I mean, I think Kane is close to his size and, and a better worker. Uh, but uh, Kurgan, it wasn't that he wasn't a good worker, it was just that Kurgan was still fairly green. He hadn't had a lot of experience uh, wrestling longer matches. Now, uh, you can argue whether he should have been in long matches, but at the time, there was a move afoot to, uh, that the big guy should be able to go longer. Um, also, wherever Kurgan had been at, at seven feet, he was always just 
towering over people. Now you go to WWF at the time, and you had guys like Kane and, and whatnot who were close to his size. Um, he didn't look as much of a monster as what he did in other territories. So I think, you know, with the right amount of, uh, of, of work, he, he could have got to the point where, you know, he could have been a lot better in the ring. Um, I think he was, he was fine for, for a huge guy, and I think he would have really flourished there in the 80s when, when they had different expectations of big guys than, than what they do now, where they really want these guys to go out there and, and do a lot of stuff and, and be a more complete package than they used to. So um, I think he was fine, but uh, I, I just think his timing was not the best in terms of being a big guy going there at that time. The other question was, um, what was it like working with the other teams? I mean, it was great. I mean, uh, the people in the group were great. Um, Luna Vachon was tremendous to, to, to be around, and uh, I knew her her uncle real well, uh, Maurice Vachon. He helped me out a lot in the business. And, um, you know, uh, the other guys, I mean, Kurgan, obviously, I'd worked with a lot. John Tento was a real gentleman. So uh, it was real fun to work with him. I just think that um, there was a, a kind of a, a lack of, of direction in terms of where they wanted to go at the time. I think that, um, you know, at first they wanted them to be heels, and then and all of a sudden the, uh, they decided they wanted them to be baby faces. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I honestly think that, that the group had a chance as heels. Uh, had they continued to kind of bring in the outside talent, like uh, like Vince Russo had done with the uh, the Howard Stern characters and whatnot, I think that there would have been a real kind of shock TV effect to it where people would have tuned in to see who uh, would be uh, traipsed out in front of the crowd that week. And, um, you know, we had, Vince Russo and I had come up with a long list of people we could use for that. So as heels, I think it, 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 I, would, I would have enjoyed it a lot. We never really got a chance. What about you leaving the WWF? Well, they didn't renew my contract. Oh. And, um, they uh, they had basically been paying me to uh, to sit at home for about three months, I guess, mm. and um, they kind of um, weren't sure what to do with me because um, Vince wasn't real high on male managers in general, mm. and you can kind of look at how Jim Cornette was used when he was there, um, and and the fact that they really didn't have any male managers. Vince has never thought that male managers draw money. Well, you can debate that all day, but at the time he was kind of like, well, we're not really sure we want to do male managers. Then uh, at one point I was supposed to be the color commentator on Heat. Um, that fell through, and uh, three times I was offered a job to, to move to Connecticut and work in the office to write. And I was kind of resisting that because I, I probably foolishly still wanted to be a performer hmm. on camera. So it was kind of like uh, I think Jim Ross told a, told one of my friends. He said like we just didn't know what to do with Don. He wanted to be a performer, and you know Vince wanted to go a different direction with him. And, you know, they were kind of paying me to do to sit at home up in Canada, and they just said like, we don't have any ideas for you right now. Um, the door is open to come back, and uh, but we're not renewing your contract. And nice of them to say the door was open to come back, but but the reality was that, you know, I had to had to make a living, and so I sulked for a couple of days, and then I made a couple of calls, and uh, within about three days I was uh, in ECW, and uh, really was the best thing that could have happened to me because. I was, you know, perfectly happy to be in, in New York and uh, making money to stay home, which probably uh, makes me a little bit lazy, I guess. But uh, yeah. going to ECW gave me a fresh start, gave me an opportunity to uh, to go out there and do what I do, and uh, really was the highlight of my career being there. So had they not released me, uh, I never would have got a chance to do that. Hmm. Speaking of ECW, how did ECW compare to the WWF? <laughs> well, obviously, you know, a lot smaller, a lot less money. Hmm. Um, but uh, I, I liked it better just because I got to do more. Um, it, it's frustrating, I think, as a performer when you, you feel like um, you know you, you can do a lot more than, than what you're being allowed to do. And, and in WWF, I think it was more a case of just you've got all these guys who are really talented and you've only got two hours of TV time to, to get everyone on because at the time they weren't doing SmackDown yet. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's tough to get into that rotation. And, uh, it's frustrating, too, because you know that you can go out there and do a good job and you want to be given a chance. So in ECW, uh, you know, you got that chance, and it was great. Um, I really liked the, the atmosphere. I mean, I had a lot of friends there. Lance Storm and Jerry Lynn are, are two of my best friends in the business. And, mm. um, you know, Paul Heyman and I became fairly close, and uh, Tommy Dreamer, and, and just a lot of really great people. And, and it was great timing for me to go there when I did because it was – um, six months before they started up on national television. So um, that six months gave Paul a chance to kind of become comfortable with me. 
Um, and then by the time we hit national TV, he had basically put me into the top heel spot in the company, and uh, and I was getting a lot of exposure both as a as a pay-per-view color guy and uh, as on-screen talent. So uh, I it was a place I loved going to work, and uh, it, it really makes me sad when I when I think about the fact that it's not around anymore because it was just a fabulous place to work. Yourself and Joel Gertner had a long-standing uh, announcer feud, culminating in a match at Anarchy Rules. Uh, how did you enjoy working with Joel? Um, uh, well, I, I didn't enjoy wrestling Joel because, um, you know, Joel's not a trained wrestler. So um, the match that we had was, was terrible, basically, because, I mean, a match with Joel was going to be terrible because Joel wasn't a wrestler. Mm -hmm. um, Tommy Dreamer actually told me that uh, there's no way I could get, that anyone could get a passable match to Joel Gertner, and then he proceeded to congratulate me when he said that I did it at the pay-per-view. Um, I also had a pretty bad neck injury uh, when I wrestled that match because um, I had hurt my neck training to the point where I could hardly move it, and uh, I'd actually had a car accident subsequent to that where I'd hurt my neck. Um, so I, my neck was almost immobile, and because originally what I had wanted to do, because Tommy had kind of jacked me up about you can't get a match at a Gertner, um, you know, I wanted to go in there and, and pull about 12 or 15 with him and basically just take a ton of bumps and do the flare routine and, you know, kind of just bounce all over for him and make him look like a million bucks. Uh, I physically wasn't able to do that, and they did not want me doing that because they just had no faith that he could pull off the match. And so Tommy basically laid the whole thing out. I tweaked it, and then we did it. So, as, as a, I mean, people liked it because when, when people would see me do things physically in ECW, whether it was, I remember the first time I, I beat up Paul Heyman on TV, uh, people were amazed that I could throw punches and kicks because these guys didn't realize that I was a trained wrestler because I didn't talk about that. Um, so people liked the match with Joel. I didn't like wrestling with him. I loved working with Joel when we'd be out in front of the camera. I thought he and I had a lot of uh, chemistry as well as Joey Styles. Um, I think that the match took place uh, a couple of months too late. I think that had they done that match in either May or in June, or excuse me, July, uh, probably July at the Heat Wave pay-per-view in Los Angeles would have been the optimal time to do it. I think we did it too late. But uh, working with Joel was great. I mean, um, I don't think you could argue that, that for a time that was that angle probably had the most heat uh, in the company for, for a, a, a short time. So, and which is amazing when you think that you know you're talking about two non-wrestling performers uh, that are involved in an angle that, that has a lot of heat. And, I mean, you're certainly seeing an angle between announcers right now on WWF TV. So, it just proves that if, if something has the right chemistry, it can work, whether it's you know pure wrestling or not. Mm. You were the leader of the network, and the network um, got panned by a lot of internet journalists as being a quote-unquote rip-off of the NWO. How do you answer those critics? Well, to say that it was a rip-off of the NWO is ridiculous. and I mean, I, I don't really look on the internet that much, but the odd time I'll get sent something, because of course I'm good friends with Joey Styles, who uh, owns part of OneWrestling.com, and um, so I hear about stuff, and sometimes people will send me the really ridiculous stuff. And I'm always amazed at how people who spend so much time studying wrestling just don't aren't able to get anything that's not, you know, completely black and white and in their face. They're not able to understand subtleties. And maybe this is me giving wrestling fans too much credit, but I don't think that I am, because I think the wrestling fans go and see movies. They watch uh, shows like CSI. They watch shows like MI5. They understand subtleties. And, uh, you know, I think different times when I've tried to bring that into my character, uh, sometimes it's been tan. To call a ripoff of the NWO is a very pedestrian remark, frankly, because, um, you know, you could say it's a ripoff of Mr. McMahon if you wanted to. It's still not correct, but it's probably closer because they're both authority figures. The NWO was anti-authority. They were, they were outsiders. The, the network was the ultimate insider. And, mm -hmm. and the Cyrus character, before it actually evolved into network, the Cyrus character was a takeoff on wrestling office people. And he was a guy who was the ultimate swerver who came in and, and had people in the back believing that he actually had some stroke around there as the office, and uh, just by the way he acted. And uh, my father used to tell me, if, you know, you want to get what you want, walk into a place and act like you own it. And that's what the Cyrus character did. And then everyone kind of thought, well, he doesn't have real power, and then we swerved it into he's working for TNN, which was perfect because the network legitimately didn't like our show. 
so you know anyone who would say that is a complete moron but i mean i have to say that uh, i'm not that surprised because i've come across quite a few of them hmm. Could you tell us exactly what the heat was between the, the actual TNN network and ECW? You know, um, I, I'm not sure uh, how much of that was was Paul maybe having a sense that you know uh, they were de they were going to make a deal with Vince and we were going to be off anyway, so he tried to try to turn them into heels. Um, I think for sure you're talking about a, a network which at the time, and it's funny because it's evolved into something totally different, hmm. a network that at the time was very kind of homegrown, folksy country. Absolutely. You know, you know uh, and, and here we were. I mean, we were ECW, and, and we were, you know, out there and cutting edge, and it was, you know, we were on, on between rock and bowl and, and uh, roller jam or whatever. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so legitimately, if you looked at it, you know, it was a complete dichotomy, and uh, I, you know, I mean, I met with the people at TNN, and they always said that they loved it, and they, they loved the stuff that I did because they they saw themselves being represented, I guess. And I don't know how much actual heat there was. I know that, that we had to be careful about what we did on that show, and I know that we had to be careful, uh, you know, in in terms of, of timing and things like that. So uh, there was a little of that. In regards to the mic skills that we spoke about earlier on. Um how would you advise some of the younger talent that's just entering the business on the indie scene? Um, how would you advise them to improve their mic skills? Well, I mean, the old basics, um, you know, Chris Jericho and I used to talk about this all the time. and I used to work on mine a lot uh, in the car, actually. Um, and uh, he used to do his in front of the bathroom mirror a lot. I did that a little of that, too. I think that helps. But I think that um, you have to be comfortable. Um, with your character, whatever, you know, you have to figure out first, you know, what am I? Like, you know, my, uh, what kind of wrestler am I? And what, what does my wrestler, what's his thing? Like, what's his deal? What's his gimmick, if you want to call it that? Um, <clears throat> and as you become more confident with the character you're portraying, um, and if that character is, is close to your own personality, because that often, the best characters often um, have elements of, of the person's real personality, the more comfortable you become, the better the interviews will, will be. My interviews um, in ECW uh, six months in were a lot better than they were the first two months because the first two months I was still flushing out the character. Um, and the first two months I wasn't getting to interact with anyone. I didn't have an angle with Rob Van Dam the first two months that I could talk about. I couldn't talk about Rob Van Dam the first two months and get people mad because I wasn't in an angle with him. Um, same thing now for me in TNA. I mean, uh, you know, I, I've been working hard to, to contribute, but I haven't really been super ecstatic about uh, about anything I've done yet because in the sense that I think that I can do a lot better. Um, but I'm still flushing out. This is a new character I'm portraying. I'm still flushing him out. And, um, and I'm just now starting to interact with Jerry Lynn a lot, which I like. And uh, it's going to get better and better. So I think that you got to really, you can practice all you want, but you've got to really, I think, know what your character is and then when you're de when you're doing an interview about somebody, you have to remember, well, what's this other person about, and how can I uh, make that work for my character? And then the other thing that's really important is always remember as a young wrestler, if you're doing an interview about somebody, say whatever you want about the guy, but make sure you put him over first. You don't go out and, and you know say the guy's a piece of crap because then you know if you if you beat him, you just beat a piece of crap. So it's important. You know, to I would always build the guy up as as, as whatever great athlete, blah blah blah. You know, and and then I would get a shot in on him, but I would never denigrate the guy's wrestling skills because then you know you, you don't have an opponent to wrestle anymore. Going back to ECW, did you see the demise coming? Um. Well, certainly. Um, you know, when we started to hear rumors that uh, WWE was negotiating with TNN, you know, you start to get worried. Um, we also knew that, you know, the, the, the payroll, I knew the payroll was high, and I knew that, uh, you know, the, the, the revenues maybe weren't what, what they were. Um, I certainly knew that the company wasn't in the best shape it could be in, but uh, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of us are, were in denial because we liked, liked it there so much, and we believed in Paul, um, and I still believe in Paul, but uh, I think that... Um, a lot of us were just in denial because we didn't want it to end, so mm. we would hold on to any kind of hope that it would get salvaged, that, oh, well, if we get booted off TNN, we'll, we'll get on USA, you know. Mm. And, 
So I guess I kind of knew, but uh, I really, really didn't sink in for me until uh, until uh, January when you know we kind of realized that well, that's it. <laughs> In terms of wrestling, what, did you, what have you done in between um, your time in ECW and uh, your reappearance on TNA? Well, uh, right after ECW closed up, I mean, when it, when it became really obvious that that, that was what was happening, um, I gave Lance Storm a call because, uh, of course, he was uh, in uh, WCW at the time. Mm. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, Dave Meltzer actually called me because I guess he had been talking to uh, Eric Bischoff and... Uh, Bischoff was saying he wanted to get some managers in there, and uh, he asked Meltzer who we thought we, we should get, and uh, Meltzer said, uh, you know, you, you definitely need to sign Don Callis, because uh, at the time, Bischoff was with Fusiant, and they were going to buy WCW. Right. Um, so, uh, Bischoff, uh, so Bischoff said, well, do you have his number, and Dave didn't have my number, but he said, I know that he's real tight with Lance Storm, talk to Lance. So Bischoff talked to Lance, and uh, Lance put me over, of course, and basically, uh, uh, I think I think he gave Lance uh, his personal cell to, to give to me to call him, and I called and talked to him, and uh, he was uh, you know very receptive to, to basically saying they wanted to sign me, and at the same time uh, Lance had actually told him that what they should have me do is color commentary. At the same time they're negotiating I think with Joey Styles to, to be the color the the lead play-by-play guy on Nitro, and Joey was negotiating for me without me really realizing it to be the color guy on Nitro. So whether I would have gone there as a manager or color guy, I don't know. But I basically had a deal to go. They were just waiting for Fusion to buy it. So I was pretty comfortable, actually, um, despite the fact that I was depressed about ECW closing. I was pretty comfortable with the fact that I knew I was going to have a job, and a job that would probably pay me more than I was making in ECW. Um, so uh, I didn't do much of anything for a couple of months, and then when the Fusion deal fell through and the industry evolved into what it is right now, uh, the reality hit that, uh, you know, this business sometimes can be feast or famine if you're not careful because you can go from making a, a, a really nice income and doing something that's a lot of fun to, to not having anything. And uh, I just never wanted to be in that position again. So. I kind of said, well, i got to do something. I already had a university degree, but I realized that to, to lead the kind of lifestyle that I'd been grown accustomed to with wrestling, that I would have to uh, upgrade my, my skills in terms of education. So I took two years. I went back to school, and uh, I, I uh, did my MBA and uh, just finished that actually this July and, and uh -huh. started up with the TNA right away because they, they had been talking to me for a bit. And uh, so that's what I've done, and I feel a lot more comfortable being in wrestling now because, although uh, although I really enjoy you know working for TNA, and I hope that I, I get to do that for a long time, um, I know also that, that with that MBA, um, I'm able to, if I had to, to walk away from wrestling entirely, and and, uh, and I'd be able to get a job, um, you know, beyond working in a coffee shop, which is nothing wrong with, but it's just you know not for me after being involved with wrestling. So it's given me that security. And uh, and then that's been really helpful. So that's where I've been for the last two years. Hmm. Recently, you turned up in NWA TNA. How does the atmosphere compare to ECW? Um, I think in some ways it's, it's similar. I mean, uh, well, first off, there's a lot of the guys. You know, um, hmm. uh, Jerry Lynn, and one of my my best buddies, um, Shane Douglas, a really close friend of mine, a guy who's been a a mentor to me in a lot of ways. Um, you know, Raven is a pal from there, and Sandman, and New Jack, and different guys. So a lot of familiar faces. But also, I think that um, you know, there's that kind of uh, upstart attitude that hey, you know, we're uh, we're here, and we're just gonna you know work our butts off, and and uh, and you know let people make their choice. You know, I mean, uh, we kind of are the alternative in a sense, just like ECW was, and, and we are different, just like ECW was. And, um, so I think there are some similarities, and, and uh, in a really good way. Hmm. Dan, would you like to take the next one? Um, in recent weeks, um, people have really started to support TNA and give it its fair shake. Um, some people say that without a national TV deal, they're doomed to fail. But uh, how do you think the company is going like, to evolve over the next, say, year, year and a half? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, from a... From a business perspective, I look at this company um, and I say, uh, this is a high growth company. Um, the wrestling industry is, is down right now, it's in a down cycle overall, but uh, there's still, it's still a pretty big market. And I think there's, a, there's enough market share there for, 
uh, for, for one or two other companies. And um, so I, and I think TNA also has a really good, uh, uh, you know, business backer in, in Panda Energy. Um, some really smart people involved with that. They're doing a lot of the right things, I think. And I think that the, the Jarrett's, uh, both Jeff and uh, his dad, Jerry, really, really know the wrestling business. And uh, then you've got, you know, Vince Russo, who really is a very creative guy. Uh, Glenn Gilberti, very creative. Uh, so you've got a good balance, and you've got a lot of talent in that dressing room. The X Division guys, guys like Raven, guys like AJ Styles, who I think AJ Styles is very much like Rob Van Dam was in ECW in 2000, you know, where he is mm. so different. And I think, and I think like Rob, I think AJ is probably the best athlete in the business right now, athletically. Um, mm. And just so different because he's such a good athlete that he really stands out. So there's a lot of similarities there. So I, I think it's a high growth company, and I think um, I don't know what's going to happen with a with a TV deal. Um, I, I do think that if if people watch TNA, as uh, as we're hoping they will, obviously with a one cent deal, right. um, if people watch TNA, uh, I think they'll be hooked on it. And because uh, I know I got hooked on it when I first started watching it. So right. however that ends up happening. Um, they've got the hard part figured out, which is they've got a great product. Now you just got to find a way for people to find it. That's right. Mm. When you made your debut with the company, you used with Edward Chestnut, who is yeah. no longer working with the company. Um, well, how was the how was the um, idea brought up to pair you two off? Um, hmm. Well, I, I guess they they felt like um, you know they wanted me to to manage someone and. Uh, uh, you know, he was a guy who uh, was in the NWA already, and a big guy who we'd heard some good things about. And uh, they wanted someone to work with Sandman, and uh, so they put me with him. I didn't really know anything about him, and uh, you know, it didn't work out, I guess, the way that, that they had hoped. And uh, so now I'm I'm kind of by myself, and uh, you know, doing a doing a thing with Jerry Lynn. So. Um, uh, I don't really know how he, how he ended up being the guy that, that I ended up with, but uh, I just know that you know he's a real nice guy, and I think he's he's got a lot of talent. It just it, you know didn't work out for whatever reason. You speak about working with Jerry Lynn. Um, how do you think your gimmick's going to um, run its course in the future? Well, um, I, that that's tough to say. Um, I I think that uh, there's stuff that that I can do with Jerry that'll that'll really. I mean, believe it or not, my, my main concern in doing something with Jerry is, is that it helps Jerry. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not Jerry Lynn. I'm, I mean, Jerry Lynn is, uh, you know, uh, probably the, the best complete wrestler, total package that, that, that we've got. And he, he was that in ECW. I think he was that in WWF. He just didn't really get a chance to, to show it. Um, he's an awesome awesome performer and he's he's like uh he's like our bret hart you know he's the guy who can go out there and, and really perform with anybody the fans respect the hell out of him hey. um so if i can do something uh in an angle with him that that, that makes him that much more over um and, and makes people want to see jerry lynn that much more if it's to see jerry lynn kick don Callis's ass or, or whatever then i'm happy you know I'm, I'm not really so concerned about how don Callis benefits from it because uh um, I'm not really about that in, in this business anymore, uh, and this is why I really enjoyed doing color commentary in ECW. Was um, it gave me a chance to help other people get over, and um, uh, I don't know where the Jerry Lynn thing's going to go, but but I hope that it, it goes in a direction that, that really helps Jerry. Uh, do you mind if we close out with word associations? Basically, sure. basically we'll just say a name, and if you have a story or anything like, you don't have to give a one word answer. Uh, one word answers are fine, but if you have. Uh, story that you'd like to tell or anything you'd like to share, um, feel free to go ahead. There's no time restraints on this thing. Okay. Okay. First name we got is Jerry Lynn. Oh, um, awesome, awesome wrestler and awesome guy. Lance Storm? Lance Storm? Um, hmm, real underrated, um, really intelligent, and uh, w one of the best guys in the business at shining other people. Just incredible. Um, fantastic worker. Um, uh, doesn't realize how good he is. Don Marie. Don Marie, a uh, great girl, um, real uh, sexy girl, and uh, fantastic talent as uh, as both a manager and, and a wrestler. Electra. 
Um, Electra. Re really, really nice person, and uh, and a really, really cool look, I think, for wrestling, and a, and a different look. Joel Gertner. Joel Gertner. Um, funny. Joey Styles? Um, Joey Styles, uh, one of my best friends in this business, and uh, just uh, just a real straight shooter, and uh, in my opinion, the best play-by-play -play man in the business. Francine? Um, Francine's a lot of fun. Paul Heyman? Um, Paul, uh, Paul is the guy who, uh, who gave me my best break ever in this business. And, uh, he, uh, Paul did what all you can ever ask of a promoter. He allowed me to go out and succeed or fail based on my own merits and didn't hold me back. Jerry Jarrett? Um, don't know Jerry real well yet, um, but uh, I think he's uh, got a brilliant mind for, for wrestling, both in terms of uh, booking and in terms of uh, being a promoter. Jeff Jarrett? Um, fantastic. One of my favorite wrestlers to watch, um, even before I, I went to, to uh, NWA TNA. And... Um, I think he's one of the best. He was one of the best heels uh, in wrestling in the '90s because he was a, a heel who um, who really knew how to how to work a crowd and really knew how to shine an opponent. Vince Russo. Very creative. Um, um, very uh, very unselfish in terms of. Uh, always thinking about ideas for the younger guys, not just for the top guys, and uh, a, a, real, um, a real good guy to, to work with. Bret Hart. Um, Bret Hart's a legend. Bret Hart is um, a mentor to me. Bret Hart got me into the World Wrestling Federation, and uh, Bret Hart is, uh, I think Bret Hart is, a, is about as close to a, to a living legend in this business legitimately as, as you'll ever find. James, do you have any more? Yeah, how about Owen Hart? Um, you know, Owen was one of the nicest guys uh, ever in this business, and uh, Owen helped me a lot when uh, when I went to WWF, and uh, just uh, just a great guy, and it's a, it's a shame that uh, that he passed away. Tommy Dreamer? Tommy is uh, is, is one of the, the nicest and the funniest guys in this business, and uh, He's uh, got a real dry sense of humor and uh, a lot of fun to be around. Dan, do you have any others? Vince McMahon. Um, really cool guy. Um, fun, uh, fun guy to watch perform. I think uh, I always like watching Vince's stuff, and um, you know, a, a real, a real force of nature. His personality, for sure. Dan, do you have any other questions? Mm, one more. Uh, what would you like to say to your fans? Well, if there are any out there, um, I guess I'd like to say, um, you know, just uh, uh, take take advantage of uh, of the one cent TNA deal and uh, and and get hooked on the product because uh, you're going to like it and uh, and keep watching uh, TNA and keep watching Don Callis, I guess. Mm. Once again, we'd like to thank you for this interview and stay tuned for more from the interactive interview. <laughs> Enjoying what you're hearing? Be sure and check out WrestlingEpicenter.com on social media at Facebook.com slash Wrestling Epicenter. On Twitter at James Epicenter. And of course, WrestlingEpicenter.com for 24-hour news updates, our interview archives, and all the other information you've come to expect from the Wrestling Epicenter. <laughs>